Here's the overview of the presentation. It looks like a lot, but there's only 10 slides. Three, uh, three models I'm gonna try out. Um, two requests, that is sort of two to-do items. And if we have time, um, one big idea. Just to start, we're gonna use a, a geographic model. Um, that's the, the essential point to make about biofuels and biofuel demand in this hemisphere is that it's being strongly driven by a set of fairly recent mandates, that is targets for um, development of this industry. Uh, the United States is part of the uh, 2005 Energy Policy Act passed a renewable fuel standard, which called for the United States to uh, produce and use 7.5 billion gallons of biofuels or ethanol uh, by the year 2012. Canada also has a mandate of 5% ethanol uh, use or biofuels use in their total gasoline supply by 2010. Two other actors are very important. I, I understand that Ontario this year uh, was trying to get to its 5% ethanol and gas supply standard. I don't know if that was uh, reached or not. The other player I want to focus on is California. California is developing a low carbon fuel standard as part of its AB32 climate change uh, legislation, response to climate change that California is pursuing. Quickly about the industry, the top five uh, industry players control 30%, 37% of the total U.S. production. Um, so not a highly concentrated market yet. Uh, maybe when it's a mature market, it will be more concentrated. Um, the new capacity in the pipeline is said to be 6.2 billion gallons. So there's a lot to, a, a lot in the pipeline to be produced. Archer Daniels Midland, of course, a big player. And they pulled down an estimated $2 billion worth of, of subsidies for their biofuels division. Cargill recently announced a doubling of its production. The, um, the actor I'd like to focus on for just a moment, however, is a company called Verisun. Verisun wrote the following to their shareholders in their 2006 annual report. Quote, a number of our competitors are divisions of substantially larger enterprises and have substantially greater financial resources than we do. Smaller competitors also pose a Institutional investors and high net worth individuals could heavily invest in ethanol production facilities, and that could lead to an oversupply in the demand for ethanol. That was written last summer. What they were looking at is, as a medium-sized corporation specializing in ethanol, they found that they were in a rather precarious financial position as compared to some of the other actors. Uh, we now move to a picture of uh, Central and South America, um, and just Note that um, other nations in the hemisphere certainly also have bio biofuel aspirations. And the picture gets complicated, and it's complicated in part by U.S. Uh, trade strategy. Uh, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'll take the time to go through the different targets of, of what folks are doing, but let me just um, note a couple of things. First of all, um, <clears throat> CBI, Caribbean Basin Initiative Nations, um, nations that are part of CAPTA, uh, the three pending uh, FTAs with Peru, Colombia, and Panama. All of these uh, countries have a special tariff-free or low-tariff um, access to the U.S. market. So Brazil can export its fuel stocks for finishing in one of the CBI countries, and that ethanol can be uh, imported to the United States under a different tariff regime. Um, essentially, you have a situation whereby up to 7% of U.S. consumption of ethanol can be imported uh, without that secondary tariff, that 54 cents a gallon tariff, um, up to 7% of total supply. And if the fuel stock is from within the CBI, within the Caribbean <coughs> Basin, um, then there's additional 7%. All this is um, important, in my view, for a political reason. If you look sort of on the, the west side of South America, through, through Central America and South America, what we have here is a picture of U.S. trade policy, U.S. trade strategy, right? Which is to sign bilateral agreements with all of these countries. Uh, it's not exactly surrounding Brazil, but it is flanking Brazil. Uh, and the idea being that this is one of the areas to um, put pressure on Brazil. We'll come back to this point in just a moment. 
In terms of the, uh, in terms of Brazil's strategy, Brazil also has some interesting options. Right now, it can export directly to the United States. There's still a 54 cents a gallon tariff that has to be paid. Um, it can export to an intermediate country like Jamaica or Costa Rica for processing and re-export to the United States without that secondary tariff. Brazil can export to the EU. Brazil can export to Japan. I would note that last year, Japan passed a 3% ethanol mandate in that country. Just that 3% in Japan. That could consume 90% of Brazil's total ethanol exports. So uh, Brazil is not absolutely wedded or tied to the U.S. market. It has options. And uh, that may explain some of the behavior that we've seen over the last year in terms of movement on U.S. and Brazil on um, biofuels. Um, okay. <clears throat> Let me move to another kind of model. This is a, a uh, uh, an institutional model uh, regarding U.S. participation in biofuels standard setting. Folks familiar with the ISO, the International Standard Setting Organization. ISO is the body in which uh, international product or service standards are determined uh, by interested parties. And the interested parties are shown at the bottom of this slide. Industry consultants like Sidley Austin, Sidley Austin being a large um, uh, law firm that has more than 50 clients uh, lobbying in front of ISO. You got corporations, you got industry associations, and you got other standard setting institutions. Folks familiar with this logo on the left side of the slide, people know what that is? API? The American Petroleum Institute. So let me just run through this quickly. At ISO, you have a technical committee, technical TC28, petroleum products and lubricants. That's the place where biofuel standards are being written today written globally, okay? The secretariat for that standard setting process is housed where? At the American Petroleum Institute. Each country is represented at ISO through a technical action group, a TAG. Who administers the TAG in the United States? It appears to be the American Petroleum Institute. At an international level, the different uh, national groups have their tags, which are uh, uh, giving input to TC28 and to the Liquid Biofuels Subcommittee. And again, at the bottom, we see uh, these different actors who are giving information into the national standard bodies, leading companies, industry associations, etc. Over on the right-hand side, we have a question mark. Who's not there? Who's not part of this ISO process yet? Everybody got a hand mirror? Hold it. <laughs> Civil society is not involved. Also not involved are any U.S. states or Canadian provinces or any other entity which is pushing a low carbon fuel standard, okay? So one of my key messages, I guess, is this is an extremely important process. It's very technical, uh, but right now, those standards for biofuels that will govern biofuels trade in the future are being written. They're not being written in the WTO. Uh, they're not being written through a NAFTA or a trade agreement. They're being written by ISO. But once those international standards are in place, because of the WTO rules, um, WTO and other free trade agreement rules, a country is obligated to refer to those international standards once they are created. I'm going to quickly create a, uh, a little model for how this, um, this industry is developing today. So you can just look at those little circles as sort of a guide to how this model is created. I think what we're seeing here in the top is current market structures it's not yet being driven by international trade, it's being driven by tariffs and a set of decisions that are taken at the national level. Carbon pricing probably shouldn't even be there, because carbon pricing so far has not been part of this overall model. <clears throat> but in March of this year, Brazil and the United States signed an MOU which pledged, quote, closer cooperation on researching alternative energy production promoting alternative fuels in the region, and developing industry-wide standards and codes that could lay the groundwork for a global biofuels market. So as part of this U.S. Brazil cooperation model, we're seeing a heavy emphasis on technical standard setting. We're seeing the integration of CAFTA countries and other Caribbean countries as possible intermediaries for biofuels trade. 
Uh, it may push Jamaica and Trinidad towards new FTAs in the United States so they can lock in that market access in the future. Uh, and frankly, with 70% of global biofuels production taking place in either Brazil or the United States, if Brazil and the United States get together on developing an international standard, that will become the de facto global standard. So what's happening right now between the US and Brazil on setting standards for biofuels is, um, in my view, extremely important. Um, just to leave you with one, one slide, if we were to think about how best to um, get that carbon pricing thing, how to get a low carbon fuel standard in place, we'd work in two areas. One would be the technical standard setting, which hasn't been done yet. And the other, of course, is legislation addressing climate change, which is increasingly happening at state and provincial levels, not yet at the federal government level. 